Hi, everybody. Welcome back. This is the first webinar for Agbio Data of the Year. Uh, before starting, I want to give a short, um, I will give some announcement. Um, so first of all, there are some updates on the steering committee of Agbio Data. We want to thank uh, uh, Eva Wala and Marcela Tellerwitz. They uh, moved on. And so we are very thankful for their work during these years. And we have a new member in the study committee, which is Sunita Kumari. She is a plant bioinformatician and works at the Cold Spring Harbor Lab. Um, she, um, has, uh, she has worked in the past with the Grameen and the K-Base project, and her work involved primarily genomics, comparative functional genomics, and regulatory networks. So we want to welcome her on board, and we want to wish her um, a, a good work. Um, and before starting, we want to remind to all of you that um, AgBioData will have the first community workshop in March. So we, it's three-day online uh, all hands workshop. And there will be two hours of the day uh, from 9 to 11 a.m. Central Time. It is a very great opportunity because working group that are currently working with us on our project, they are going to meet with each other, but also with the public. And so we really invite all of you to join because we need public feedback on our work and on our mission. Um, and with this, I want to pass the word to Marcella, which is the, also the mediator for today's webinar. And I want also to mention that the speaker of today have prepared a poll at the end of the presentation. So please stay in and help them to answer the question. And then, yeah, Marcella, you can go ahead and start introducing the speakers of today. Thank you, Narita. Um, so today, uh, Timothy and Baron, Timothy Cesar and Baron Coilas agree to kindly um, introduce us to the to the research the European Variation Archive hosted at EBI. Um, Tim has been a lead by informatician at the EBI's uh, European Variation Archive, also known as EBA, for the past two years. Tim got his master's in bioinformatics from the Pierre and Marie. Marie Curie University. And before joining the EBI, he worked at Edinburgh Genomics for 10 years as a software developer and manager, and is highly experienced with NGS data analysis. Um, Baron, Baron um, he did his uh, bachelor's in medical biotechnology and his master's in genetics in, of human disease. He has been help, um, a help desk by informatician at the EBI for the past uh, three and a half years. And they have worked together to give us this uh, awesome presentation. So uh, all yours, guys. Ah, thank you for the introduction and uh, welcome everyone. First, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting us to give this uh, presentation. <coughs> and um, I'm just going to get it ready and share my screen. So hopefully everyone can see that. Uh, well, and yeah, just to give a, another sort of introduction. Um, so uh, uh, I'm Baron Coilus and I've been working at the um, European Variation Archive as a health desk bioinformatician again for 3.5 years. Um, previously I worked um, as Marcella stated with human data and now I'm working with the uh, data from all types of species, which is always an interesting point. And um, it's very interesting just to learn something new from different communities every um, day. So without further ado, I'll move on to sort of the outline of the um, presentation itself. So just to give you an idea of the flow of how things will go, it will start with an introduction to the European Bioinformatics Institute, where we're actually located, and another sort of overview introduction to the European Variation Archive itself. And then we'll move on to the um, archival and accessioning. So this is one of our roles in um sort of receiving data and what we do with the data. And then we'll move on to the data access, as in how we, once we um, sort of do our processing of the data, how we then get it back out into the community and then how it's then used and sort of the annotation and the what we do with the quality of the data as well. 
finally, we'll finish up with some final notes just to uh, sort of summarize everything we've gone through. And um, hopefully we'll have some useful tools that you can also use. And lastly, as it was previously mentioned, we'll sort of have a, a Q&A survey poll session. Um, a lot of the work we do and a lot of the future work we're planning is sort of um, dependent on feedback from the community. So this is a large part of something that we uh, ideally like to do to improve the quality of the EVA. And um, yeah, it'd be brilliant to get some good uh, feedback. So just starting with an introduction itself, um, what we do is a fair resource. So what we mean by fair resource is that um, essentially we want to ensure that the data in the bioinformatic community within these various resources is um, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, we need to ensure that um, anything that we is archived in a particular resource has a sort of unique global identifier. And if we query the identifier in one database, we can use the same identifier and find the same data in another database. And it also needs to be universally accessible and open and sort of um, free to access this data. Um, but the data also needs to have a certain quality to it. It needs to be detailed enough that um, whoever's accessing the data knows how the data was generated and then can also reuse the data and also knows sort of the software that was used and the pipelines that were used to gather the data itself. And that's what we sort of um, aim to keep as a fair resource. We want to ensure that the data coming into us is also the sort of piped back out into the community and it can be found and reused um, whenever, wherever or whenever. Just an introduction to the, also the European Bioinformatics Institute. So this is actually where we're situated. And um, I like, it's a good point just because we interact with other resources at the European Bioinformatics Institute, which is, um, it sort of highlights the importance of fair data. And the European Bioinformatics Institute can be described as sort of a home for biological data services, um, research and training also. And it's um, part of the uh, large part of the European Molecular Bio Lab Biology Laboratory. And the EVA within the European Bioinformatics Institute can be described as an open access fair data resource at the EBI. And essentially we're responsible for permanent storage, accessioning of genetic variation data from all species. And um, this is a it's this is a it's a good graph or a good diagram to uh, sort of show the different resources at the EBI. Um, it's a bit sort of a uh, overload at the moment, but you can see that there's many different resources at the EBI, and um, they're sort of split into different clusters. And um, I like to demonstrate how um, we sort of interact with different resources at the EBI. So we're located at the bottom here in the molecular archives. Um, so we have the European Variation Archive. We also have the European Nucleotide Archive and also the European Genome Phenome Archive, which can get um, quite confusing when you get to ac the acronym level. But um, I've highlighted the European Nucleotide Archive, Biosamples and Ensemble, just because um, the data we have in the EVA um, links to these other resources. For example, as you'll see, the sample data we contain at the EVA is linked to biosamples. And then the variation data we contain at the EVA is also linked to the ensemble database. And these are some numbers that we currently have within the EVA. So we currently house around 3.4, just over 3.4 billion variants across around 370 different species. And we hold the variation data so that's the genetic data from any species and it's within and across populations, including subspecies. But we also display the metadata. So how the data was gathered, um, the experiment described, the pipeline used and the software used, and also the samples that the um, data was gathered from. But uh, we also have the annotation data associated with um, our variation data. Um, this is actually generated using the ensemble variant effect predictor, and it shows the functional consequence and population frequencies amongst uh, different data sets. 
And just to give you an idea of more um, numbers associated with the EVA. So these are sort of um, some of the top class of species we have. So on the right hand side, you can see the number of species and the sort of the growth of the EVA through the recent years. If you take a look at um, around 2019, there will be an exponential growth of the number of studies and the number of species we had, simply because this was um, when we had to import a large um, chunk of dbSNP data, non-human dbSNP data into our database, and also make that readily available um, to download and to be used. So that gives an overview of the EVA. Um, we can say that um, essentially we're an open source resource, a fair data resource responsible again for archiving and accessioning. But um, how does that actually work? How, does, how do we receive data? What do we do to the data? And how do we ensure that we get it back out into the community? So this is a brief overview of our submission process that we currently have. So it starts at the submitters level, whether it be a consortium or an institute working on variation data. And there's two files they need to provide to us in order for us to archive data. So one's an EVA metadata template file. And this describes the associated metadata, the software used, the analysis. And we also have the VCF files, the very core format files, which we'll take a, a deeper look at and we'll actually see an example of. They send this to the EVA help desk, which you'll, uh, majority of the time you'll find me on the other end or a member of my staff, uh, one of my colleagues. And um, we essentially get this data in, run it through our data validation pipeline to ensure the data is valid and sort of fair. And then we come to the end of the pipeline and we produce a project accession and an analysis accession, which you'll also see um, are also linked to the ENA. So these are unique identifiers that can be used to grab the data sets. So if you query the EVA database with the project accession, it'll bring up the associated project. Um, but it also can be used in the ENA to bring up the same associated information, just so our data is linked between the two databases. And this is the um, sort of the same information for the analysis ID as well. So just to go into more detail in regards to the two different types of files that need to be provided to the EVA. I'll first talk about the metadata file. And essentially it's a sort of an Excel spreadsheet that needs to be filled in um, that contains some controlled language cells and um, some free text entries. And it's split into four different sheets. One of which is the project, which the submitter can describe the project title and give a brief description of um, their project. And another is the analysis sheet where the submitter can then describe the, um, the software and the, the pipeline used to generate the data. And the project and analysis are linked to the ENA. So as I previously said in the um, previous slide, that um, once the project and analysis IDs are generated, they can also be used to query the ENA, which will also bring up the data as well. There's another sheet where the submitter can also provide the sort of the biological entity information, um, the samples. And then this, the sample information is also linked to biosamples. So those samples submitted to us will be also archived in biosamples, receive a unique um, sample identifier which can then be used to query the sample information in the EVA or biosamples. And lastly, we have the file sheet, which just lists the um, sort of the files associated, the VCF files associated with the submission, just to ensure that the metadata is linked to the variant information and it's all sort of encompassed in one project. So that's the metadata sheet. Um, how do we then handle the variant data? And the variant data is received in variant core format files, whether it be a single file or multiple VCF files. The VCF data we receive must adhere to VCF specification. And this is what we mean when we say that the VCF files must be classed as valid. And we have a number of tools that aid us in ensuring this, which can also be downloaded locally. The VCF data must also contain the allele frequency or genotype information. 
uh, it's checked manually with the VCF validation suite. Um, again, that's the some of the tools we use to ensure the data is valid. And we also actually provide a VCF template file on the EVA website, which we'll take a look at, um, which allows sort of uh, users to manually input their varied data and then convert the file into a VCF file. There are a number of software tools out there that um, sort of generate VCF files from um, raw data, raw um, NGS data. And um, it, many of the time you find that uh, if someone is working with sort of a single variant, they'll use the VCF template file, put in the single variant into the VCF template file, and then use that as a conversion and generate a VCF file containing that single variant. We also have other requirements. Um, these are sort of to ensure that, again, it's always to ensure that the data coming into EVA is as fair as possible and it's validated because we are, again, making ensuring this data is going back out into the community. So we need to ensure with the submitter that the data can be openly distributed and that the reference sequence used to generate the variant, to highlight the variant information is um, registered by an INSDC database. So the, um, the reference sequence resides in a database such as um, NCBI or the ENA as well. And if we are working with human data, we also require a consent statement for individual human genotypes. So this slide actually demonstrates a nice recent VCF that was actually sent to us. And um, you can see the header lines was just provide an abundance of information. In this case, more related to the, um, the contig alias used and sort of the length of the sequence. So you can see that this, with the context alias used, we can see that this the ref reference sequence used to generate this VCF, um, the reference sequence resides in the INSTC database, and it was assigned these, um, these INSTC contig labels. Um, we can also see that the reference bases match the ones in the assembly from the reference sequence. The sample names need to match those provided in the metadata. Again, the um, submission is accompanied by the two files, the metadata file and the variance files. So we need to ensure that these two pieces of data match each other and are come under one project. And in this particular instance, um, the submitter hasn't provided the allele frequency data, but we can see that we have genotype data for each individual sample. And this is one of the VCF files that were recently sent to us and made available back out um, via the EVA website. So this was downloaded directly from the EVA website. We'll see um, when we get to the uh, data access side of things. So once data is received and sort of archived in the EVA, what's the next step? And um, how do we sort of enrich the data and uh, make sure that the data can be used and queried? Well, this is done by our variant accessioning database, our variant accessioning pipeline. And the basis of this is that we need to ensure that we're assigning these unique identifiers to these variants so that um, when they are given back out into the community and um, there's such an, an abundance of variants out there, we can query the specific one we're interested in um, just using a unique identifier and we can find all the associated information. If you look on the left-hand side, you can see that this is an example of a VCF that would be submitted to us. And we have the header columns at the top, so the chromosome, the position, the ID, the reference, alternative alleles, and the quality, which is cut off in this example. But what we're actually focusing on here is the, um, the ID column, because you can see that originally, the original submitted VCF um, that will be sent to us will contain an ID column that will contain, well, no information. It will just have a full stop character. Once we archive this variant data, run it through our variant successions database, this is what's then returned. So we can now see that it still contains the same information, it's the same variant information, but now this ID column is now populated with these SSIDs. And these are the unique identifiers given to um, variants in order to be able to query them. But then we can move a bit further with these unique identifiers. So then we have these SSIDs, which are unique to a study. So what that means is um, if we receive this initial submitted variant, so we receive a variant on the human genome 
chromosome, uh, sorry, the um, human genome assembly 37 on chromosome one at position one, two, three. That's submitted to the EVA, gets run through our validation pipeline. The data has been archived and we assign this variant a ID of SS111. We then, for instance, receive the same variant uh, by a research team more than halfway across the world from a different research team. But they're reporting the same variant. So they've also used it to map against um, GRCH37, chromosome one, position one, two, three. They're finding the exact same variant. We'll archive this data, but then provide these users with a, these submitters with a SSID of SS222. And this can also be the same case in a third scenario where we get the same data, same data, same variant and provide that with SS333. What we then do is that periodically we then cluster these variants into an RSID. And more often than not, you'll mainly see RSIDs referenced in associated literature. And when you do query an RSID, you'll find that um, more often than not, you'll find they um, the, sort of all the SSIDs that were clustered underneath this RSID. And it's a good way to determine that um, what your the variant you're looking at is indeed a variant, because if you're querying an RSID and then you find the associated SSIDs underneath the RSID, then you can say, well, my variant is also being reported by other consortiums, by other research teams. And yeah, that's mainly why you'll see the RSIDs more often than not quoted in um, publications and referenced. And it's a good way that the variant data can then be cross-referenced between different databases. What you'll also see is that um, when we take a look at the data access, you'll see that you can query the RSI, RSID via the EVA database. But there's also other databases that also use RSIDs, such as Ensemble, such as the ENA or other there's another independent project such as Snippedia that they use RSIDs as well. And um, it's just a way that the variant data is then cross-referenced between these different databases and ensure the data is fair. So for the data access, um, I'd like to take a small break from slides just so we can take a direct look at how data is actually accessed at the EVA. So we have various methods um, of data access, some that will suit the uh, some people other than more than others. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to ensure that um, you know, bioinformatics is a very multidisciplinary sort of area of work. So we need to ensure that anyone accessing the data can do it by their preferred method and whatever pipeline or tool they're using, they can access the data, query the data, whether they need it in bulk or whether they're querying a single variant, they need to be able to ensure that they can access the data as well as intuitive as possible. So the first thing we have is a study browser. And this shows the data associated with individual studies, but also allows the raw data of that study to be downloaded individually. This is where I previously mentioned that studies and projects, well, projects will be assigned these um, unique identifiers, these PRJEB IDs. You enter that into the study browser, as we'll see, and this will bring up the study page where you can download the data. We also have the variant browser, and this is mainly used to query individual variants, but it also allows sort of bulk querying of variants. Um, it displays additional information as well, sort of the uh, annotations associated with the variants, the genotypes and the population um, statistics. It also allows the variants to be downloaded in the um, sort of the comma separated for format or the uh, um, VCF format. It depends on what query is built. We also have an FTP, which allows bulk downloads of data, um, whether it be per sample, um, apologies, per assembly or per species. And we also offer a REST API, which is a nice computational um, a way to access EVA data via computational methods. And we'll also take a look at um, some examples of a West REST API query and um, sort of the benefits that it can the, um, the ways that it can uh, sort of allow EVA queries to be built into pipelines and built into sort of scripts to, get, um, to be able to have bulk downloads of data. So I did want to take a look at the, um, the EVA study browser. So if I just link out, I'll give a zoom in just so we can all see in a bit clearer. 
So just on the EVA website, So this would be an example of the a study browser query. So it comes up with the project title at the top. Um, so bulldog dwarfism and Dexter Castle. And this is the associated metadata with the study. So we can see it's come from the uh, cow genome. Um, it uses Bos Taurus as a sample. Um, the taxonomy ID of the species and sort of the uh, type of data it's encompassed from. So we can see the genome assembly um, whether this project also has an associated resource we can link out to, um, the publication associated with this data, but then we can also see these, see these two download links here. And the submitted files and the browsable files are what allows us to download the raw data associated with these, um, with, these uh, with, the, with the study of interest. So if we click on the browsable files, we can actually see it takes us out to an FTP, which we'll also take a look at further on in the data access. But this is just a good way to, it's a, it's a good way to query a study of interest. If I actually go into the study browser itself, you can see that um, it has this sort of layout where we have the results page on the right-hand side, but we also have a filter options on the left-hand side where we can filter by short genetic variants, structural variants. We can search for, um, if we know the title of the project, we can do a text, free text search. But then we can also can organize and query by the um, genome of the species we're looking for. Further down in the filter options, we can also take a look at the uh, type of um, project we're looking for as well. But as you can see, the, on the results page on the right-hand side, they do have these um the project IDs listed on the left, and if we, that's when we if we link out and click on the project ID, it will take us to the project study um, project page which we were previously looking at. But then this is where we can also sort of query, <coughs> sorry, using the project ID, and it will bring up the project we're looking for. And it's a good way, again, to download the raw data associated with the project, but also check that the um, sort of the project successfully archived in the EVA and it's made publicly available. So that's the, um, the study browser. It doesn't have as much options as the variant browser, which we're going to take a look at, but um, it's mainly when you are looking for a study of interest and you want to download that data associated with that particular study of interest. What we then have with the variant browser is sort of the same sort of layout we have with the study browser, where we've aimed to keep the results window on the right-hand side for our queries. And then we have the number of filter options on the left-hand side. And these can be filtered by the assembly, the, um, the chromosomal location, the variant ID or the ensemble gene um, accession. So the variant ID is what we were looking at with the RSID but we can also query by genes or chromosomal, look, um, chromosomal um, sections. And we have a number of an abundance of other options where we can sort of filter by the consequence type and the minor allele frequency. Anything that um, adds a bit of the sort of the annotation to the data, we also add some um, query, query, queryable options for those. So if you do look on the right-hand side, you can see that this will be our results page. And we can uh, just increase the number. And we can see that we have a number of variants, um, sort of the chromosomal position, the variant ID. Um, we can sort of download these as a CSV or VCF files, which were mentioned. And we can also take a look at the what files and what studies these variants were reported in. If they have associated genotypes and what the genotypes were between the species, I mean, sorry, not the species, between the samples. And then we also have the population statistics just in case we do want to look at the um, sort of how it was reported within the project. And if it was sort of a large project, we can see the population statistics between the these different projects. If you also take a look on the right-hand side, you can see that we have link outs to the sort of the, um, the EVA page, the ensemble page or the DBSNP page for this data. So this was just the EVA page for the data. 
and we can see that for this particular RSID, this this variant, we can see the cro the chromosome and the um the SSID that was that was um clustered underneath this RSID. And it's just a quick summary of how we can view the variant data on the EVA website for these particular variants, or how we can then download the data if we wanted to do a VCF download of the data using the variant browser. But that's it for the uh, the browsers. There's a number of different options you can do. Um, as I said on the left hand side, there's filtering options. It all depends on sort of what data you're attempting to access and um, sort of what variant or study you're looking for and how you want to download the data. If you want to download the individual variants or if you want to download all the um, original VCF submitted for that project. So an overview of the um, browsers was that, uh, again, you can query them via direct, direct text search, raw data download set, um, raw data and variant download data sets, um, the annotation and the population statistics and the genotypes associated with these projects. Uh, and what we'll find is that um, we're constantly sort of going, looking for ways to improve how data is accessed and um, how the data can be queried. And this important thing is that um, we sort of build our features on feedback from the community, who's using our data and um, how are they finding the methods of data access. So then we also have the FTP. So the FTP is a good way to sort of access bulk data downloads for um, EVA data. So again, I'll take another break from the slides. So this is the page I previously linked out to when I was going through the study browser. So when I went to the, um, the study page, queried our study that we're interested in and went to the browsable files, it will take us out to this FTP here. And what you'll find is that um, we have the raw data, the raw compressed VCF for this data, the associated index file, and we also have the accessioned VCF for this data. So this will contain, as you saw on the slide, this is what's um, sort of the output from our accessioning pipeline. And we'll have all the variants from this VCF file and their associated SSIDs. But that's the FTP for um, downloading data from um, individual studies. We also have our sort of our RS release FTP. And what this allows is um, this allows bulk downloads of RSIDs associated with particular species or particular assemblies. And this is the data that we receive from submissions, all clustered into RSIDs and released back via our FTP. What I've done here is I've queried the uh, BOSTORUS FTP, and it contains a number of files for the UMD 3.1 uh, BOSTORUS genome build. So it has the current RSIDs, the associated index files we always provide, which speeds up um, querying via computational methods. We also have deprecated and merged files. Um, these are files that uh, the RSIDs, um, they've been assigned for a number of years now. And um, sometimes you'll find that um, as we're attempting to make data fair within the community, um, we're taking a look at sort of legacy data and finding it's not, it's either missing things or um, sorry, it's either missing data or um, we can't link it back to something we would class as fair data. So we assign these variants RSIDs, but um, we can't, we then, we don't wanna lose this data. This is classed as legacy data. We don't, we've assigned this RSIDs in the past and um, we don't wanna, essentially we don't wanna lose data within the community. So we've then also decided to provide these back via these merged IDs and these deprecated ID um, files. But if you are just looking for the current RSIDs used within the community and then used um, that are currently active, you can find this, um, the file here. What I've actually done is um, I've actually downloaded the boss Taurus file. 
So I'm just going to zoom in a bit. Uh, so this is just terminal window to show you what the actual raw data download looks like. So you can see I actually have the um, the UMD 3.5, UMD 3.1 file here. And what it provides is it provides a VCF file. And if you go down to the variant lines, you can see that um, it has the uh, variants and their associated RSID. And then the, again, these are all the variants that were received to um, received via submissions to us, clustered into these RSIDs and then released as these bulk downloads. And as it's in within our FTP, they can either be queried or um, sort of integrated. The queries can be integrated within um, scripts and we can just do a bulk download of this data. So that's sort of the FTP access we allow. So the downloaded data sets can be, um, you can download accession data sets per assembly and species. We also provide the deprecated and merged RSIDs that um, they possibly still use within the community. So of their legacy data, we didn't want lost. We release these um, periodically and the you can also, download the, um, the original submitted files associated with each individual study via the um, FTP via the study browser, whether they be the raw VCF files or the um, accessioned VCF files. I'd like to move on to the, um, the EVA REST API now, and I'll sort of uh, another break from the slides for the um, REST API. So before I actually discuss the um, talk about the API, it's just important to note that the API provides the same data that you can find on the EVA website. But um, it's it's a good benefit of the API is that um, it can be sort of be integrated into automation tools or scripts and um, accessed via the command line, simply because the results are um, they can be queried and output the output is returned in this JSON format where we then have the sort of the key value pairs and the elements that are described, um, that describe the study. So for this example, I'm using the study that we've you looked at in the study browser. And you can see that we have these, the pairs here, where we can see the, the name of the study, which we previously looked at in the study browser. The same information that was described in the study browser, sort of the description, the, um, the center that generated the data, the uh, project, the type of data, uh, type of project it is, and the reference genome assembly. And it's a good way to sort of, again, query the data and the data can then be passed and you can grab pieces of information that you're particularly looking at for a study of interest. So I'm just making sure everyone can hear okay. Sometimes I talk too close or too far from the mic and it gets, um, it's one of those things when everything's virtual now, everything has to be, um, the sound has to be a good standard. But um, a good thing to note with our uh, REST API is that we also provide a documentation page, the Swagger, uh, we call the Swagger documentation page. And what this does is that it sort of allows us to then query the, um, the clustered variants. So again, we can we have the sort of the documentation on what this allows us to do. So this is it sort of describes what we can do with the API. So we can either query by a clustered RSID, uh, query sorry, query by um, the identifying fields of associated with the RSID, query by an actual RSID, and just put in the number of the RSID and return the information. And uh, more information, so, so more options if we want to clear, query the SSIDs or if we want to find an RSID that exists within our database by identifying fields. So this is a good way if you do want to sort of test out the API. And um, you can sort of hit the, uh, the uh, Swagger documentation, try it out. And then I believe I have an RSID that we'd like to do. No, I don't. So 
So we'll take a look at one, two, three. So I'll put in um, this just a quick example on RS RS one two three is a nice uh, quick one to work with as a good example, and we execute. And what this does is that it first gives us the uh, curl command that we can use to download the data if we were accessing the API via our terminal. Um, sort of the request URL, the endpoint, and sort of the response returned. So this would be the information associated with the RSIB. This would be our result. So the genome assembly, the star positions, um, the taxonomy from what the, um, the species, the RSID was derived from. And if we take the endpoint URL, I put that into our web browser, you can see it returns the sort of the same JSON results page that you saw with the, um, using the API to query the study information. And it provides a number of these, um, uh, the uh, key value pair fields that can be passed for information. So the API and the FTP, so the, what we've covered with the um, data access was the, um, the two types of browser, the study and variant browser. So this is the homepage of the EVA. And the data access that we've covered was from the study and variant browser. What we can actually find is that um, on the homepage itself, We've also added this nice little search for SNPs box here, because a lot of the time, if you are working with a variant and you, do, you have the RSID, you're looking for ways to be able to query the RSID um, and just find the information associated with it. So if you do go onto the EVA website and you know the RSID you want to query, you can simply enter it into this box here and it will come up with the EVA variant page for that data. And below the SNP search query box, we actually have the, um, the, uh, the FTP, the link to the FTP and the link to the API. But the MPI will actually take you to the Swagger documentation page and the FTP will take you out to the, um, the whole, the parent directory of the FTP. That might do the... Uh... So when I went through the FTP actually as well, um, I forgot to mention that uh, if you actually go back to the, this is the parent directory, and um, you can see that you can actually filter down your results by species and assembly. So I went to, um, I went down by species, went down to Bostaurus, and the these are the um, the INSD accession, the NCBI accession sort of thing for the genome assembly, and the name of the actual genome assembly. And I was in this sort of directory here where I download the bulk data associated with this genome assembly. It's actually filtered through whether if you want to query by assembly, if you want to query by species, and it'll take you out to the, um, the parent directory and you filter through and get to the bulk data of the species you want to download. So I included this result slide just to give an example. Usually the API is something, um, it's one of those uh, sort of fail safe just in case when, when you demonstrate something during a talk and it doesn't happen to work. So we put in a, a nice little slide here where you can see the results and how they're returned in a nice little JSON format to what we previously looked at. And just a uh, sort of a, um, a brief summary of the API. Again, it's always important to know that um, it provides the same, the, the information, the sort of the bulk information, the, the browser information that can be accessed from the EVA website. It, it allows programmatic access. So they can be the bulk data or the way data is accessed at the EVA can be automated into pipelines. And we also have the Swagger documentation available, just in case you did want to see the different ways that the data can be, the API can be used to uh, sort of query this data. Um, so just some final notes. Um, I did want to mention that, um, yeah, the EVA, it's essentially, we're sort of, we do the two sides of things. So we are receiving data. We, we look at two sides of things. We're receiving data from the community, ensuring that data is fair and ensuring that the data that we're receiving is fair, that we can output it back into the community. 
So we essentially were described as a fair resource for genomic variation data from all species. The data is received to us via VCF files and the associated metadata file. And these are required for VC, um, sorry, VCF, EVA submission. And this is how sort of the data gets to us. Once the data is, once we receive the data, we run it through our validation pipeline. And then we have these accessions generated for the project, um, the analysis, associated analysis, and for the individual variants themselves, which are then clustered into RSIDs. Once that's run through, the data is then provided back via the EVI, EVA UI, the API, and the FTP, which then allows sort of this individual queries to be built, or the, um, the bulk download of data per species or per assembly. So coming up to the end of the slides themselves, um, I also just wanted to give, a, again, a big thank you for the organizers for inviting us to speak today and the co-chairs, um, Doreen Ware and Tao Ho Chang. Just a reminder that we do have the uh, Slack channel and that the next meeting is on the February the 16th at uh, 10 o'clock ET. Yeah, I, wanna... I just want, yeah. sorry, Baron, yes, that's just me who slide that, uh, that uh, put that slide in at the end, because I wanted to advertise uh, the um, Genetic Variation Working Group uh, that uh, Doreen and, and Tao have, uh, are sharing. So our next meeting is yeah, uh, on February the 16th. Um, I think we should be able to share the slide um, with you guys so you can you can find your time. Let's just click on that link. I just have a comment quickly. Um, we had also invited uh, Gary Sanders in 2018, February uh, 2018, and he gave us a little overview of the transition from for all of the non-human genetic variation data from DBSNP to EVA, and that um, the resource as well as the recording, I believe, are, are available on the Arbio data website, if anybody's curious for that. No, that's a good point. Yeah, that was a big part of our work um, in 2019, the uh, process of moving that data over to our database. So yeah, it's great. And just to finish up, I also wanted to also um, ask if there are any questions, do please then write them in the chat so we can do we can take a look at them. Um, but I also wanted to ask if a um, We'll take this time, to, uh, any questions that can be asked. And um, we're also gonna open a poll at the moment as well, why the questions are going on. So uh, Anarita, if that's okay. Yeah, I just opened the poll. So you guys have time to answer. And did we also have any questions uh, from any of the participants? Uh, not yet. I have a question. So are these data automatically passed along to Ensemble so you can see them in a genome browser? Um, I'll take that one. So it's it's uh, the automatic part, probably not, uh, but that's definitely part of our, our, our collaboration with Ensemble. So I meet with Ensemble almost every month because we want to have all of our data to be represented in, in Ensemble as much as possible. Um, so the um, the release, the RSID that Baron presented, they are going to be part of um, of Ensemble's normal tracks that you can see in a genome browser. They will also select specific studies that they are interested in and that they think are relevant, and they will display those um, those specific studies. Um, one thing that we have been working on last year and that that we didn't really want to to show today because it's not it's not uh, completely ready is that we have worked quite hard to um, take all of our data and map it to the newer version of the genomes. Uh, some of that data is historical and is on very old version of genomes, and so we have. Um, remap all of that data to newer version of the genome and that was a prerequisite to show all of the data on ensemble because ensemble 
is, you, is supporting with very specific versions of, um, of genomes for each assembly, for each species. Uh, and that's, we need to be in sync with them. So we have actually not now put that work in. So hopefully they will, all of these RSID should be visible in a, in a genome browser on, in Ensemble, yes. Any other question? Yes, please, if you have any questions, this is the time. In the meantime, they are filling the, the poll. So let me know. I will give it like another minute and then I will end. If you guys are fine with it. Just a show of hands. If anybody uh, hasn't finished with it. I think I'll um, should, should stop sharing my screen for the time being. Just so, um, because I'm not sure if you can see the poll. I can, yeah, sorry, I can. Okay, I will close the, I will end the poll. Sure. And share the results. Do you guys see it? Yes. Yeah, yeah I can see so it. So can, I can talk over it quickly. I mean, the first one is I'm, I'm actually quite happy. Uh, it's always something we are, we, we are not completely aware of uh, how, uh, how aware the rest of the community that, that we exist. Uh, um, so I'm very happy to see that uh, most of you did. Um, uh, and, and the second question for us is actually quite important. It's, uh, I mean, it's obviously an audience of people who are interested in, in, in uh, variation data or at least uh, genomic data. Um, so yeah, it's good to see that there's a, a good chunk of you that could have data that could end up in, in EVA. And so we encourage you to, uh, if you are not um, already doing it, and if it hasn't been submitted already to, to, to submit it to, to EVA, uh, we're here to help to provide you with whatever you need to, um, to put that data into, uh, um, into EVA or, or another resource that will host it. Uh, maybe we can, we can come down to question number four. Oh no, question number three. So I guess that question for us is also quite important because very often people come to us at the, at the, at the very end of their project. Once it's been completely submitted to a pay, to the paper has been written, it's been submitted to a to a, a journal, and the journal comes back and say, "Oh, you need to have an accession uh, from from an from an archive. So this data needs to be deposited, and that's when we have a rush." And because people are obviously, um, you know, uh, in a hurry to get the, the, the paper out, and we are the last, the last uh, mm -hmm. barrier. Yes, sorry. Um, yeah, there is a question in the chat. Can you take it? Um, oh, of course. Your, sorry. Yeah. Leonard asks: Are there any arrangements, publishers, regarding submission to Eva? Any requirements? Um, I, I don't I don't know if these are arrangements, but uh, yes, uh, more and more um, uh, journals will require that your the data that you are uh, publishing is submitted to uh, to um, to archives. So if the data that you're publishing is uh, variation data, then uh, very often they will require that they, uh, the the uh, data is available on EVA. Um, I was just thinking about how, you know, very often when people are writing their papers, there may be information, you know, about like data submission, but, you know, the problem is, as, as you know, right, that when people are writing up their results and then they're thinking about submitting, they haven't even considered all the metadata that they should have been collecting from the beginning. Yeah. So, you know, I guess one of the challenges is having people sort of be mindful of this as they're generating the data and not just as this sort of afterthought when they're trying to jam it into a repository. 
Indeed, and that, that's that's really a challenge, and 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 because it, and it's also something that is not very very easy to enforce. And so one of the things we do is we make sure that the archive of the variance is done, but and we also make sure that we link as much as possible uh, this uh, this variation data um, to samples and to other source of data uh, in the ENA and in biosample, like uh, Baron mentioned. Um, but we don't we don't really have any way of enforcing, for example, that the sample that have been created in biosample are are rich in phenotype, and 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 so there's been several endeavor, including in in Agbio Data Consortium, to um, to uh, encourage people to gather uh, metadata associated with the sample or with the product in general. Um, to uh, to enrich the, um, the the contextual data, the metadata um, that is linked to to the variance. Um, and yes, the timing is important for that. So when people are aware of these problematics very early in the project, they can collect uh, the data much more uh, efficiently. That's a good question that we're finding. Um, when you do look at some journals, I think they, they they're listing sort of EVA as a recommended. Uh, repository for this data and finding um once we've archived it in the EVA um the main thing these like what a good thing submitters are looking for is um that again via the study browser that all their data is visible via the study browser and then they're providing that the the visible view of their data on the study browser back to the journals and then the journals are saying okay yeah the data is archived in the EVA The, the last set of questions were about uh, data use or data reuse. Um, we have put a lot of emphasis uh, in the past couple of years on, on making sure that data is submitted in the best way possible to EVA. But we're now trying to push uh, people to reuse that data. There's, uh, there's a lot of uh, platforms that could benefit from using that data, whether they are uh, individual researchers or whether they are, are um, as, you know, community databases. Um, that can be, you know, can really be uh, useful for people to uh, know how to retrieve that data. So um, one of the things that we are pushing now is for people to be aware of how they can access the data and how it's been enriched and how we're going to continue to provide it uh, in the future. So I'm quite happy to see that uh, um, a lot of you want to use the data and um, There's a thing um, on question four. One of the fields is um, the, uh, if you if you don't know how to submit data, because I think it's um, one of the things that's good about the EVA is um, we don't have like a dedicated submission or our submission portal isn't sort of like an automated process. The submission started by emailing us, and then um, usually what you'll find is that um, we sort of because it's like sort of person to person submission process, we can guide submitters through the submission process. And um, you know, if the if the data is not like valid the first time, you can come back and say, oh, this isn't correct, and um, suggest some fixes. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's a good way to, when you just start the submission process. It's sort of like a nice conversation as well. Right, I think we are at the hour. So I think do we do anything, um, Anarita? Um. Yeah, I think we are close to the hour. So I want to thank you both for the, this great talk. Um, so just to remind all of you that I'm going to post the video on YouTube. So if you want to rewatch, um, you are you can go to our YouTube channel. And also, you you if you have any question, you can contact Byron and Tim. Uh, they are also in our channel. So feel free to reach out to them. And also thank Marcella for hosting. And yeah, thank you all of you for um, being here today. And we hope to see you in March for our community workshop. Have a nice day.